Now, Washington Mornings on the Mall. At AM 630. It is 807, Brian and Brian on WL, where Washington comes to talk. I uh, want to talk to uh, Ben Smith, who is the editor-in-chief of BuzzFeed and a good friend of this program for some time now. Ben, how are you this morning? Good. Thank you for having me on. All right, gasoline prices. It is really driving uh, sort of what's going on uh, around the water cooler is what people talk about. It's also sort of having an impact on what's going on with, uh, with politics right now. How big a, 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 a role will this play as we continue to go forward in this electoral process? Well, I think people will talk about gas prices a lot, and I think, you know, I mean, particularly as they go up. I mean, I think the the White House's hope, and there's some research that suggests that people get used to high gas prices really fast. Like there's this wave of grumbling, and you and, and you think it's going to be like you know the president's going to be impeached next week over it, mm-hmm. and then like two weeks later, everybody's used to four dollar a gallon gas. Uh, I think that's what the White House is hoping. <laughs> is it'll continue to go up. That's uh, that's wishful thinking because I got a feeling that people are going to be not getting used to four dollar a gallon gas and getting even more irritated every week they go to the pump and it's four dollar a gallon gas. Yeah, no, I, I think I mean I think it's clearly going to be a, going to be an issue in the election. It's certainly something whoever the Republican nominee is is going to talk about. And you know, President Obama four years ago was was out in front of a gas station talking about how gas prices when he you know right. once he got in and implemented his pet plan. Gas prices were going to go down, so it's a little hard for him to complain now that it's unfair. All right, so right now, as we look at the Republican side of the equation, we we saw Mitt Romney did very well in uh, Puerto Rico, got all 20 delegates that were available there, turns his sight now in Illinois. He's he's up in the polls in both in, in both polls I've seen in Illinois. And, and as you look at the schedule going down the line, coming up are states where he's expected to do pretty well. Do you think he's going to get enough momentum to actually get 1,144 delegates, or are we headed to some kind of open or brokered convention? You know, it looks like it's close in terms of whether he'll exactly get the get to 1,144, and that's um and and his win in Puerto Rico certainly helped, and that's exactly the sort of place where he's been winning places where people aren't really paying any attention at all to the election, where he has a big kind of establishment machine on his side, or. Our reporter who was at his rallies there over the weekend basically said, you know, nobody even knew who Mitt Romney was, but they were out there for Governor Fortunio. Um, and I think, you know, nobody else has that kind of organization. So even while voters are split, Romney does have this edge. And, you know, and it, but it does seem possible, certainly, that, that we're going to head into a convention where he doesn't quite have 1144. It's a little hard still if he has 1,100 delegates and there are 44 outstanding to see how anybody else gets the nomination at that convention. Right, I, that's what I was going to ask. I mean, if he's close, if he's close, then he's probably going to come out of the convention as as the nominee. I was wondering if there was a number that you could say, even though eleven forty four sews it up completely, is there a number that that's around like a thousand where you say, hey, if he's over a thousand, it's going to be Romney's no matter what. Yeah, that's sort of my guess. Because at some point, like there are going to be some delegates getting ambassadorships to you know the Bahamas. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> I mean, the presumptive nominee has things to offer. All right. Now, there's some talk. Obviously, people are in the Republican Party. There are a lot of people who want this thing to end and get it over with. Whoever it's going to be, just pick one, whether it's Santorum or whether it's Romney, maybe even Gingrich. Pick one. Get over the fighting and concentrate on going after the president. Um, there is still this possibility that they could go to a convention. We may not know who the winner is. The nominee is until August. How devastating is that for the Republicans? Is it devastating for the Republicans? And, you know, is it possible for them to actually do that, go to the convention without not knowing who the nominee is, and beat Barack Obama in November? Um, it's, 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 um, it's pretty bad news for the Republicans. I mean, it's just because every day they're attacking each other. It's the day they're not attacking Obama. They're not getting any particular message across. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things people talk about is, well, maybe they could, you know, grab some even better candidate at the convention, like Chris Christie or someone. And I think I was talking to one of the one of the handful of people who's often mentioned the other day, and they said, you know, are you crazy? So in, in September, with no organization, no preparation, no money, just start running for president mm-hmm. and kind of be set into the Obama meat grinder. So I think, like, it's possible to imagine a scenario that's even worse than a weekend Mitt Romney, which is sort of like a little sort of last-minute choice of somebody who just sort of hasn't 
isn't ready. <laughs> yeah, but and the other problem with that is is that if it's somebody besides Santorum, Romney, or Gingrich, it's, well, wait a second, these guys didn't run, and you're going to handpick a nominee and force-feed it upon us? I mean, the, and who who makes that decision? The establishment, you know? I mean, Right, exactly. Who goes up into Chris Christie's hotel suite? Yeah. Says, All right, Governor, this is, here's the chalice. It just doesn't, that's not how it works. Right. Yeah, it just seems like it's, at the moment it's very hard to see a scenario other than sort of a miserable flog that winds up with Romney being the nominee. Well, I know that you follow what's going on in the world around you, and no doubt you saw sort of this flurry of activity over the weekend about the executive order uh, that was issued by the Obama White House on Friday. We're, we're still trying to sort of scratch our heads and figure out exactly what it means. Some people suggest that it has something to do with authorizing peacetime martial law. Others say, no, they're just dusting off and updating something that's been around since the 1950s. Do you have a sense of it yet or are you still trying to figure it out i mean i, I you know i saw i saw it as well i do not have a you know a clear sense my suspicion is i mean i, I you know i'm not a conspiracy theorist but I, my, my guess is that it's is that it's is, is that if they were about to declare martial law you, you would be a little less uh, less subtle yeah but it was it why we released it on friday afternoon at six o'clock that's uh, that, that is when all the good stuff goes out so <laughs> that, that, that's very suggestive Right, and it's something that they're certainly going to have to talk about. All right, Ben, great to have you on. Thanks very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Ben Smith, editor-in-chief of BuzzFeed, with us uh, on uh, Brian and Brian. So th- what happened was on Friday, right. there was an executive order that was released by the president. Right. And, uh, you know, a lot of things happen on Fridays, and there's whatever, when it does, people raise you know their eyebrows on this. And, you know, exactly what it does... Um, it's still being discussed. There are a lot of people who think this is no big deal. This is nothing different than what other presidents have done. It's updating uh, the ability for the president to do some things in times of crises. Right. And others say, no, this gives the president way too much power in a time when we don't have war, and it gives him the ability to declare martial law when we're at peace, when right. we're at peace time. Well, look... Um we're going to have to dig into this a lot, but here's my initial take, and I've been, I've been delving into it all morning long trying to get my, my head wrapped around it. And I'm not a lawyer, so this is a very legal language. It, it seems that what this does is it, it, it does something that has been in, in effect since the 1950s. It is centered around the Defense Production Act of 1950, and it's an executive order that says, okay, all of the agencies out there need to identify, uh, the industrial, the technological base, the, that we would need in times of national emergency and you need to have a sense of who these people are and who are the important players in your particular area of expertise and then it says uh, a little later that you need to then go and decide uh, which of these uh, allocations of, of resources and national sta- uh, standards and procedures uh, could be used to promote the national defense under both emergency and non-emergency conditions. In other words, if we had a real crisis, you would be the person who would determine exactly uh, what agencies, what companies, what private enterprises out there are really important to the national defense. And then it goes a step further that says that the president has the ability to take action uh, on these matters and make decisions uh, based on emergencies, including essential and military emergencies, to require acceptance. This is the part that gets me. To require acceptance and priority performance of contracts or orders to promote the national defense over performance of any other contracts. If I understand that correctly, what it does is it gives the president the ability to say, you may have a private contract to sell your product, let's say it's gasoline, mm-hmm. to like an airline. But we can come in and say there is a national defense reason why you have to give us that gasoline and we're going to give it to the Air Force. That's just a, like a made-up example. And so do you need a thing like that? Sure, in times of national crisis. But some are suggesting this goes further than others have gone before and would actually allow martial law to be imposed in times of peace. I think that's a bit of a stretch. 